So welcome everybody to Ask the Oxperts um, online lecture series. We're really excited that you're all here and tuning in. Um, my name is Carrie. I'm the communications director at the Muskox Farm up in Palmer, Alaska. And I'm Danny and I'm the education director. So thank you for joining us. Um, today's Oxpert that we get to ask some questions um, after her presentation is Dr. Pam Groves, PhD of the Institute of Arctic Biology, University of Alaska Fairbanks. That is a long and fancy title, Pam. Um, Dr. Groves has been involved with muskoxen since 1979 when she started working with the muskox farm herd while in Unicolit and helped establish the current farm here in Palmer where we are today. Pam earned her PhD in wildlife biology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, comparing musk oxen with a distant relative in China, the Takin. Uh, she has also been on the board of the Muskox Farm since 1987, so it's our nonprofit organization here, and she has been our board president since 2010. And with that, Pam, um, I'm going to finally turn it over to you, what everybody <laughs> came here for instead of the Danny and Carrie show. So thank you for your patience, and um, whenever you're ready to take it away and share your screen, it's all yours. Uh. Okay, I've never done this before. Hopefully this will work. But thank you all for joining us today. And I'm hoping to be able to tell you all a little bit about the early history of musk oxen and a few little other interesting bits and pieces of information about musk oxen that you might not know. As uh, Carrie told you, I started working with musk oxen back in the 1970s when the herd that's now in Palmer was in Unilocleat. And then I helped move that herd to the Palmer farm in 1986. Then I went to graduate school at the University of Alaska Fairbanks where I did a bunch of genetic research on musk oxen and also study wild musk oxen up on Banks Island in the Canadian Arctic. So to get to the history of the muskox species, the earliest muskox-like animals appeared in Asia about 5 million years ago in that period that's called the late Miocene. And these included some animals like the Eurymetherium that was found in Turkey. And the descriptions of this genus are based on just a few skull bone fragments that have been found. And then there was another genus called the Cytomotherium that was found in China. And this image of the animal is kind of an artist's depiction of the animal might have looked like based on parts of a skull that were found. So this was about 5 million years ago. By the start of the Pleistocene period, about 2 million years ago, muskox-like animals had radiated from Asia west into Europe and also east into North America. And these included an assortment of genus or genera, including the Eucerotherium, known as the shrub ox, the Ovibos, which was known, also known as the giant musk ox. Then there's Butherium, the helmeted musk ox, which has this very distinctive kind of unihorn rather than the two separate horns of our beloved musk ox. And, and finally, there was Sorgalia or Sorgal's musk ox. And it's important to realize that all of these genera are now extinct and they were never seen by humans. So all these images are based on uh, bones that have, fossil bones that have been found of these different genera. So we don't know exactly what they look like, but I particularly like the Sorgalia. I think that would be a fun pet to have now. So the genus Ovibos, which is the genus that our beloved Ovibos muscatus in has been around for about a million years. And the oldest ovibos bones have been found in Europe. 
The modern musk oxen are Ovobos muscatus appeared in North America about 150,000 years ago, and they got there by crossing the Bering Land Bridge from Siberia into Alaska. But this species, Ovobos muscatus, ranged all the way from Europe west across the continent to North America uh, throughout most of the Ice Age, which is also known as the Pleistocene. So musk oxen lived all across the Northern Hemisphere by about 100,000 years ago. And these animals look identical to the animals that we see nowadays. So this map from Europe, here's France, England, Italy, these little dots show where fossil musk oxen have been found across Europe. And this map here shows some of the locations where fossil musk oxen have been found in Siberia. There were a lot more animals than are represented by those dots. And then finally, here in North America, all these dots represent fossil musk oxen. And you can see that during the Ice Age, musk oxen ranged as far south in North America as Texas. And I want to digress a little bit here and tell you a little bit about the Ice Age, particularly in Alaska. And most of Alaska during the Ice Age was known as a region called the Mammoth Steppe. And kind of counterintuitively, since this was the Ice Age, most of Alaska was unglaciated. So there were these vast grasslands that extended from Alaska west across Siberia and into Europe. And these grasslands were inhabited by a great diversity of megafauna or large mammals. And this is an artist's depiction of an area near Fairbanks where I am right now about 20,000 years ago. And you can see that there were giant musk oxen. Here's our favorite Ovibos muscatus down here, but there were also mammoths, bison, a giant bear, smaller bears, there were lions. Uh, moose, yak, there were asses and horses and then sheep and then this funky little saiga antelope. So there were many more species of large animals living in Alaska and across this mammoth steppe region into Siberia and Europe during the Ice Age. And the reason we know this is that the cold soils in this region have preserved many of the remains of these megafauna. And I've been lucky enough to be able to spend about 20 years collecting a lot of remains of these Pleistocene megafauna from Northern Alaska. And this photo over here you can see a vast assortment of bones that we found on a river. Moose antler, here's a mammoth bone. There's bison, musk oxen, mammoth tusk, horse bones, another bison bone, bison and musk ox bones. So they're quite numerous on some of these rivers. Finding mammoth bones is always one of the most exciting things. This is my niece holding up part of a mammoth scapula or the shoulder bone of a mammoth. And Here's a mammoth tusk we found along with part of the mammoth skull and some large mammoth teeth. In addition to those animals, we sometimes find the remains of mastodon, which were another large elephant-like animal that also lived in the north, but in an earlier period than most of the mammoths. And then there were horses. Here's the skull of a stallion horse that we found. And then there was a giant bison called Bison Priscus. And this is the skull of a bison skeleton we found. And then we find lots of remains of musk ox and musk ox skulls persist for a long time. And that's because 
those horn bosses on musk oxen are very sturdy. And so we frequently find these skulls of bulls with most of the horn boss intact. And then we also find here's the skull of a musk ox cow and a young bull and bits and pieces. It's impressive to think that these skulls are all greater than 30,000 years old. But these skulls, which are all quite battered, suggest that they've been reworked by the river sediments a number of times since the animals died, maybe 40 some thousand years ago. Occasionally we find muskox skulls that are in quite pristine condition with their teeth and their horns and their horn sheaths still attached. And these skulls that are in this kind of pristine condition suggest that the animal died really close to where we found the skull. But again, it could have been over 40,000 years ago that it's died and the skull's just been frozen in the river sediments ever since. Here's a few more skulls. And we even found one skull of a butherium, which was that helmeted muskox, a cousin of the muskox that uh, died out at, before the end of the last ice age. Now, when we look at all these bones that we find of uh, megafauna from Northern Alaska, the diversity of species is quite large. And we're also able to estimate which animals were most numerous in this environment. And it turns out that horses were the most abundant species on the North Slope in the last 40,000 years, and they comprised about 41% of all the animals living up there. Bison were 23%, caribou 16%, and then mammoth and musk oxen each comprised about 9% of the animals. The predators, wolves and bears are 2%, and then the other strange little animals less than 1%. But this suggests that while musk oxen were always present in the on the North Slope during the last ice age, they were never particularly numerous. They just had a continuous low level presence. But this diversity of species contrasts dramatically with what we find on the North Slope today, which is shown in this graph over here. And today caribou comprise 97% of the large mammals that live on the North Slope. Musk oxen are less than 1%, moose are less than 1%, and the predators comprise about 3%. So it was a very different ecosystem back then than today. At the end of the Ice Age, there were changes, and the most significant change in the environment was warming of the climate. And this caused certain changes, including new arrivals into North America. And these arrivals included shrubs. This graph here on the bottom axis here, we have thousands of years, so 8,000 years to 18,000 years before present. And this tall green bar shows when pollen from trees, birch and poplar was first detected in the climatic record. So this means that shrubs and then trees started arriving in Alaska about 15,000 years ago before present. So that's when the climate started warming. warming. And that arrival of shrubs then enabled the arrival of moose who like musk oxen crossed the Bering Land Bridge from Siberia. And this is significant because moose, unlike most of those other megafauna that I was telling you about, like musk ox, horse, bison, and mammoth, moose are browsers, which mean they eat woody shrubs and trees rather than grasses. So those other animals are grazers. So moose couldn't move into North America until shrubs and trees, woody plants were present in North America. And 
the moose arrival was then followed by the arrival of humans into North America. And humans like moose are actually a wood dependent species. Humans needed wood for fuel so they could keep warm. And also they could use wood to build structures for houses and also sleds so they could haul their gear around. So humans arrived sometime after 14,000 years ago before present. Then these arrivals were followed by various extinctions, again caused by the changing climate. So the first species that went extinct was mammoths, and then they were followed by the step bison and then horse. And as, whoops, sorry, as I was saying, these animals are grazers, they depend on grasses. So they needed the large expanse of grassland <clears throat> available on the mammoth step before the climate warmed. And when those grasslands started to disappear, then those animals became extinct. But caribou and musk oxen both survive the end of the ice age in Alaska. And we think that's because they could consume a diet that also included the little shrubs that were invading in lichen. So they weren't so dependent on the extensive grasslands that helped those other large animals to survive. So this image here shows the Northern hemisphere at the peak of the last ice age when the glaciers were as large as they were during the ice age. And that was about 20,000 years ago. So these blue areas represent the extent of the ice sheets. And you can see that uh, much of Northern Europe and Northern North America were covered by ice. And this green area represents what we call the mammoth steppe. And this was this vast ecosystem that was home to all those megafauna. And because so much of the seawater was locked up in glaciers, sea level was actually much lower than it is now. And so Siberia and Alaska were connected by dry land, which is called the Bering Land Bridge. And that's how musk oxen, moose, humans, and many other species were able to cross from their origins in well, humans, it was Africa, and then Asia into North America. So <clears throat> during the Ice Age, musk oxen were distributed all the way around the globe. At the end of the Ice Age, as the climate warmed, musk oxen first disappeared from North America and then they died off in Europe. And finally, about three to 4,000 years ago, they disappeared from Asia. So by the end of the ice age, there were only musk oxen living in what is now Alaska. But at the end of the ice age, as the ice retreated, musk oxen spread from Alaska into Canada and through the Arctic islands and into Greenland. It's kind of interesting to note that they never did colonize Baffin Island. And that was probably because Baffin Island remained covered in ice when these other areas became exposed. And <clears throat> these modern populations of musk oxen, which live in these very Northern regions of the globe, Popu uh, their populations fluctuate dramatically in response to climate change because it's such an extreme environment. So musk oxen actually totally disappeared from Alaska in the mid to late 1800s, even though they'd been kind of the last reservoir of the species at the very end of the ice age. But I like to emphasize that this disappearance was not due to overhunting. That's a common misconception. 
And it's most likely that they died off in Alaska due to these climatic fluctuations. And Alaska is the southern extreme of the range of muskox. I mean, any species at the extreme of its range is more vulnerable to those perturbations in climate change and less likely to do well. And one of the reasons that we believe it was these climatic fluctuations that caused the musk oxen to die off in Alaska is that there were significant declines in musk ox populations throughout their range in Canada and Greenland. Now, there was overhunting of musk oxen in some parts of Canada. And this was because during the late 1800s, whalers and explorers hunted musk oxen for food, both for themselves and to feed their dog teams. And this is an image from 1900 in northern Greenland of husky dogs being used to round up some musk oxen that could be killed for food. And this photo shows some natives from Northern Canada wearing their fur parkies and pants hauling a dead musk oxen back to the ships across the snow. Another reason for overhunting of musk oxen is that during the late 1800s, musk ox hides replaced bison hides as lap robes for horse-drawn carriages. And this was before the advent of the automobile. So people in the winter traveled around in much of North America in these horse-drawn sleighs. And traditionally they'd use bison robes to keep themselves warm. But as many of you probably know, by the mid 1800s, bison had been heavily overhunted in North America. And so that prompted a surge in the market for musk ox hides. And this is a image, not a very good, it's an old photo of a uh, schooner in uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts. And it's full of all these musk ox hides that were, have been transported from Canada to Massachusetts to be used for lap robes, it's kind of sad. So, I think it's kind of interesting because musk oxen were one of the first species to benefit from efforts at conservation. By the early 1900s, there was concern that the species was in danger of extinction. There hadn't been any musk oxen seen in Alaska for a number of decades by 1900, and we know that there was a lot of exploitation of musk oxen in Canada. And even in places in the remote islands of Canada where there was no hunting in Greenland, the musk ox numbers had declined dramatically. And in 1917, the Canadian government banned musk ox hunting. And as far as I know, that's one of the first global efforts to protect a species by limiting hunting. And in a further effort to ensure the survival of the species in 1930, musk oxen were reintroduced to Alaska. And the reintroduction of musk oxen to Alaska is quite an interesting story. The US Congress actually appropriated $40,000 for this undertaking. And in 1934, 34, 1930, 34 young musk oxen were captured in East Greenland. They were transported by ship to Norway. Then they were transferred to a larger ship and traveled to New York, where they then spent three weeks in quarantine in New York City in the middle of the summer. Then they took a train across the continent to Seattle. In Seattle, they were loaded on a barge and traveled up to Seward, which is a port in Alaska, south of Anchorage. In Seward, they got on another train and they traveled up to Fairbanks where they were released into large pastures. Just about where I'm sitting right now in Fairbanks 
And I think it's quite remarkable because this entire journey took over three months and all 34 of those young animals survived that entire journey. The animals were in Fairbanks until 1936 when they were transferred to Nunavak Island, a large island off the southwest coast of Alaska. And these images, which because they're so old, aren't that great, are some of the images of that journey from Greenland to Fairbanks. Here in Greenland, you can see a couple men straddling young musk ox, and then here's one of the dogs that was used to help round up these calves. And then here's one of the Norwegians hired for the project carrying this young musk ox to the ship or to the shore. And then each of the animals was put in one of these little crates, put in the dory and taken out to the ship, which is the ship they traveled on to Norway before getting on the larger ship. So they were in those crates for the ship journeys, the train journeys, and here are the crates being unloaded from the train in Fairbanks after three months. And then finally, here are some of the 34 young musk oxen when they were released into the, their big pastures in the Fairbanks area. So they were part of a project in Fairbanks that was uh, sponsored by the university and uh, the federal agriculture program, but money for that research dried up. And so in 1936, it was decided to transfer the animals to Nunavak Island, which as I said, is a large island off the Southwest coast of Alaska. And even though it's south of the traditional range of musk oxen, in Alaska, it was thought to be a suitable location for establishing a wild muskox population because there were no predators on the island. So once again, the muskoxen were loaded into their wooden crates. They were put on a big barge, and then the barge was hauled. They traveled down the Yukon River to the mouth of the Yukon and then hauled across the ocean to Nunavak Island. Uh, there was no way for the barge to actually land on the shore of Nunavak Island, so the crates were simply lowered over the side of the barge into shallow water, and then the musk oxen had to kind of swim or wade ashore to Nunavak Island. But <clears throat> they did very well on Nunavak Island after their long journey there. And so that was in 1935 and 1936. Uh, <clears throat> by the late 1960s, there were about 600 musk oxen on Nunavak Island. And so <clears throat> that was when the musk ox herd that we now have there in Fairbanks was started and 34 young animals were captured on Nunavak Island and transported back to Fairbanks. The animals, were there in Fairbanks until 1974-75 when they moved to Unalakleet and they spent about 10 years there and then they were moved again to Palmer which is where they've been now for a good long stay and they seem to be doing very well there. So that was the captive herd of musk oxen and then there were enough musk oxen on Nunavak Island that the state decided to try reestablishing more wild populations of musk oxen in Alaska. So they first did a trial project and they moved musk oxen just a short distance from Nunavak Island to the mainland of Alaska to see how they do there. When that transplant was successful, then there was a program of transplanting small groups of musk oxen to three separate locations in Northern Alaska, which was the traditional range of musk oxen within the state. And then finally in 1979, there was one last transplant of musk oxen from Nunavak Island, again to Fairbanks where the University of Alaska has a research herd at what is called 
the Large Animal Research Station, or LARS. So <clears throat> in the last decades, musk oxen have been busy moving all around Alaska, but most of those translocations have been really successful. And there are now over 4,000 wild musk oxen in the state of Alaska. Plus we have our herd of about 80 animals there in Palmer and there are about 20 animals here at the uh, research herd in Fairbanks. So musk oxen have been successfully reestablished in Alaska, which is kind of a comforting conservation success story when we hear all these stories these days about species becoming extinct in different parts of the globe. And on a global scale, there is now a very healthy population of musk oxen of about 142,000 animals. And this map shows both the native populations of musk oxen, which are limited to Canada and Greenland, the blue populations, and then the red populations are the introduced populations. So we have our introduced or reintroduced populations in Alaska. Then there were some musk oxen introduced to the Ungava Peninsula of Northern Quebec. In Greenland, animals were transplanted from the East Coast to various places on the West Coast of Greenland. There's a small herd of musk oxen that was transplanted to the mountains between Norway and Sweden, and then musk oxen from both Alaska and Canada have been reintroduced to places in Siberia where those animals are doing well. So uh, we feel like musk oxen are stable, healthy populations on a global scale right now, which is kind of comforting. So now I want to kind of diverge and talk a little bit about what is a musk ox. Some people see musk ox and the early explorers saw musk oxen and thought they were some kind of cow. Other people have proposed that they're really a kind of sheep. Then there are those who say, oh no, they're much more goat-like than sheep or cow. Many people think that they must be related to bison because of the big shoulder hump and the big head that the bulls have. But then other people say, well, they must be closely related to yaks because they have all that fur that keeps them really warm and cold environments. And finally, people suggest, oh, well, they've got to be related to the Cape Buffalo of Africa because of those horns that they have on their heads. So well, what are they? Then there's also the taken, this strange looking animal that lives in remote mountains in China. And this was long thought to be the closest living relative of the musk ox. So quite a while ago, I went over to China and spent a couple of years studying takens to see if I could figure out what their relationship was with musk oxen. And we had this really luxurious bamboo hut for a base camp in the mountains and spent a lot of time walking around and looking for the takens. And musk oxen live in this largely treeless environment. So it's really easy to spot musk oxen from a distance, but takens tend to live in this densely vegetated semi-tropical rainforest. And so this was a much more typical view of a taken. You can kind of see its black nose and its little eyes hiding in the leaves. It was extremely rare to see a taken out in the open like this. And in this picture, there are at least 20 takens. There's a few of them right there, but it was pretty challenging to find them. But I did, collect a lot of information about them. And in particular, I was able to collect samples of DNA to compare the relationship of the taken and musk oxen. 
And this resulted in my dissertation, which was a molecular and ecological evaluation of relationship or the two species, or as I like to call it, relationship must not be taken for granted. And so what I found when I looked at the DNA is that musk ox and taken are not the most closely related species to each other, but they are part of this subfamily called the Capernae. And the other main animals in this subfamily are sheep and also goats. And so musk oxen are, I could never totally determine, but they're somewhere between sheep and goats and taken. And this subfamily is distinct from the other subfamily in the bovini, which consists of the cows, bison, and yaks. Both these subfamilies are part of the giant family of the bovidae, but musk oxen are not closely, super closely related to cows, bison, and yak. Much, they're much more closely related to the sheep and goat type animals. The other thing I was able to do in my genetic studies was to look at genetic variation in musk oxen. And I analyzed a hypervariable region of mitochondrial DNA, which is the type of DNA that's usually used for this kind of study. And I was able to sample musk oxen from across their range of Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. And when I did this, I found that musk oxen have very low levels, levels of genetic variability. So here we have four different species, musk ox, cow, and human. And on this y-axis, this is the percent of sites that are variable. And you can see that in humans, almost 14% of the sites are variable. Mice, it gets down to about 8% and cows are somewhere over 7% and musk oxen are way down here at below 2%. So that's not very much variability on a genetic level. And I believe the reason for this reduced variability is because the populations of musk oxen have fluctuated dramatically over time. So here on the y-axis is population size or number of animals and the x-axis is time. And this represents increasing populations and decreasing populations, increasing, decreasing. And for musk oxen living in this extreme Northern environment, these fluctuations have happened repeatedly over tens of thousands of years. And each time there's one of these fluctuations, the species go through what's called a bottleneck. And in each bottleneck, they lose some genetic variability. And so when this happens repeatedly over time, the genetic variability decreases. And sometimes reduced genetic variability causes concerns about inbreeding, but inbreeding is not a serious concern for wild musk oxen. So we don't have to worry about whether it's first cousins breeding and half siblings and all this. And that's because in the wild, natural selection gets rid of the deleterious or the bad genes. And that's something that doesn't happen in domestic animals or even in humans like the European royal family, which is notorious for having hemophilia, which is a genetic condition that's been passed down uh, through inbreeding when cousins are marrying cousins all the time. <clears throat> uh, another reason we don't have to worry about inbreeding in wild musk oxen is because the musk ox populations are thriving. So they're healthy and they're not suffering from inbreeding. There is a concern that the lack of genetic variability may reduce their ability to adapt to climate change in the future. So that's where the lack of genetic variability might be a concern. 
And finally, I just want to address what the name muskox comes from. And muskoxen were originally named the Boeuf Musquet by a French explorer who was the first European person to have a written documentation of these strange animals he saw in the Canadian Arctic. And Boeuf Musquet means musk buffalo. And we assume this is because he thought they looked like cows and it might possibly be because either they smelled during the rut or because they were found on the musk egg. Nobody's quite sure where the muskay came from, but musk oxen do not produce musk. Musk comes from this little Asiatic musk deer that has these amazing long canine teeth. And uh, I was like this little cartoon which shows, tell Mrs. Pomeroy we found, found the source of that strange hint of musk in the back of her car and there's a musk ox sitting there. Musk ox do have a couple glands that when the bulls are in ruts produce a distinct aroma. So it's possible that that early Frenchman smelled a rutting musk ox bull and thought that they smelled like musk. So to get down to the basics of the name, ovi is the Latin name for sheep and bos is the Latin name for cow. So you combine those sheep cow and you get musk ox, the musky sheep cow or ovibos muscatus. So that's the end of my little talk. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Pam, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Danny and I have very much enjoyed um, the puns that you threw in and all of your graphics and that last cartoon had me rolling. So thank you <laughs> for adding that into your presentation. Yay. Danny, do you want to take over on any questions? Yeah. If anyone has any questions for Pam, oh, yay, they're coming. Um, feel free to throw them in the chat and we're going to throw those over to Pam. Awesome. Oh, there's so many. This is fantastic. Um, uh, oh, it's a great question. Janet wants to know, does any other animal have such a low genetic diversity? Uh, there are other species with low genetic diversity. I think one species that many people might know and uh, that's gotten a lot of attention is the cheetah in Africa. And they are a species that is experiencing a population decline and there's a lot of research going in to whether that decline is due to their low levels of diversity. And the genetic technology keeps getting better and better. So there's more and more research going into genetic variability and we're understanding more and more about it these days. Awesome, thank you. And we're also checking Facebook too to see if anyone on Facebook has questions as well. Um, will the muskoxen survive the current climate changing? What do you think? <laughs> you know, we got all kinds of time. <laughs> million dollar question, what's gonna happen with climate change um, it's, it's really hard to say. The problem for a species like the muskox is they already inhabit the northernmost globe on the planet in northern Greenland. And so they can't move farther north to get to colder regions if the climate warms. A species that lives, say, in the latitude of New York City could move north into Canada to follow colder temperatures. So um, it's really hard to know what will happen for climate change, but it is a concern. Um, and another problem with climate change is that other species that live farther south start to move north. So there can be increased competition between species those species can bring parasites and viruses 
that musk oxen have never been exposed to before and therefore don't have immunity to. So, I mean, these are global concerns for climate change, how it's going to impact wildlife and humans for that matter. We've just been through a pandemic. We know about these viruses moving around. So, um, related to that a little bit, uh, James is wondering, is there an international cooperative to preserve the musk oxen? International cooperative, what? To preserve musk oxen. Um, well, there are, uh, I know the Canadian people in Canada and Greenland work closely together. There are conferences on musk oxen, uh, international conferences held every four to five years. So people do communicate. Um, I hear from people in Russia and Sweden periodically about their musk oxen. So uh, the, I know the musk oxen in Siberia are increasing in numbers dramatically right now. Awesome. Um, in what temperature range do musk oxen thrive the best? Musk oxen love cold weather. Oh, I don't know if I can. Um, here in Fairbanks, we've done research on musk oxen looking for their thermal neutral zone. And that's the temperature below which an animal has to increase its metabolic rate in order to keep warm. And that's like, if you go outside, well, here in Alaska, if we go outside, say at zero and we don't have a parka on, we'll start shivering and shivering is an effort to increase our metabolic rate to keep warm. Well, here in Fairbanks, we've tested musk oxen down to temperatures as cold as 40 below zero, which is about as cold as it gets here. And at that temperature, musk oxen are happy as clams. They don't have to increase their metabolic rate. So I know in Palmer, they always say that the musk oxen are happiest when it's like around zero or colder. And that's when the animals get really active and run around. So when it's hot in the summer, they tend to be pretty lazy. That is correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. They love our misery. So yeah. What do you, Danny always puts it perfectly. They, sir, they thrive in winter and survive in summer. Yeah. And we're the opposite as humans. Most of us. Right. <laughs> This is a good question. We've been wondering this too, Kane. Um, why did the did they take the route through kind of Greenland and then kind of through mainland United States instead of instead of going through Canada or inversely on that same route? Why did they get the musk oxen from Greenland and not from Canada and make them go on that long journey? Oh, uh, that was due to the logistics back in 1930 when there weren't airplanes um, and logistically it was easier to get musk oxen from East Greenland. Uh, it's easier to travel by ship from Greenland to Norway, Norway to New York, than traveling through the Arctic islands of Canada, which are generally ice covered and um, not easy to traverse. So. It, it seemed kind of convoluted, but that was definitely the easiest way um, to get there. Awesome. Um, will increasing shrubification of interior and Northern Alaska benefit or be detrimental to the muskox? Sorry, will increasing? Shrubification of interior and Northern Alaska. Um, well, there aren't wild muskoxen in interior Alaska. So uh, muskoxen range is limited to the tundra regions of Alaska. And uh, the rate of shrubification is slow enough there that I don't think that's going to be a problem for a long time to come. It's such a vast area and the number of musk oxen is actually quite small. 
So another good question. Um, how do how did they increase their numbers so well? Is it because of twins or gestation and like how long they're with their calves? Uh, Muskoxen have the ability to reproduce quite rapidly if they're in uh, good condition. So uh, this was some research that was done in Fairbanks at the research station many years ago. Uh, Muskoxen that are on a really high quality diet can give birth to their first calf when they're just two years of age. And then they can continue to give birth to a calf every single year if they're in good condition. So for example, when the muskoxen were first put on Nunavak Island or when they were introduced first to the North Slope of Alaska in the 1970s, their populations increased very rapidly because uh, they were in such good health. So if a, a cow gives birth every single year and can start giving birth to calves when she's just two, you can have a very rapid population increase. Awesome, we have a couple more really great questions. I know I won't be able to get to every single question, but um, keep them calm and we'll try to get through as many as we can. We have someone wondering how much difference is there in the lifestyle between wild herds and managed herds? Um, well, there's only a few managed herds in the world, and I guess it depends. Uh, the managed herds have a pretty luxurious life. They don't have to worry about predators. They're in these nice fenced enclosures, and they have these hardworking, devoted humans who make sure they always have enough food and get the best medical care. So uh, life is pretty easy for them. That said, in some places, the wild muskox populations, there aren't that many predators. They don't have to worry that much about predation and they can live good long lives. So um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How, we have someone asking, how long do musk oxen live in the wild? In the wild, males probably live to be about 12 to maybe 14 years. And the females, even in the wild, can live to be 15 to 18 years. Like most species, the males tend to wear themselves out at a much younger age. You know, muskox bulls do all that head bashing. They burn up a lot of energy during the rutting season. So they don't live as long. Um, females being the much more sensible sex, you know, don't waste all that energy on fighting and therefore they can uh, live longer lives and make sure they have lots of healthy, happy babies during that period. Is it bad that we say that on our tours, Pam? <laughs> <laughs> it's about the females being the more sensible, you know, that's why they live so long. <laughs> it depends who your audience is. I think you have to be careful these days. It's true. That's true. Um, so I've got a question coming in from Facebook. Um, he is wondering if it's possible to see Boxen in Quebec. And I'm assuming um, it's referring to wild, but maybe not. Um, just muskox in general, if, if you're aware. Wait, I, my dog was barking. <laughs> um, <laughs> the question is, uh, can you see muskoxen anywhere um, in Quebec, Canada, that you're aware of? I, I'm not that familiar with the geography of Quebec, but I think the uh, northern Angava Peninsula where musk oxen are is a pretty remote region. Um, there might be some roads, but I, Fort Chimo is the town closest to where they are. And I'm not sure if there's any places where you can see them or if you'd have to fly or hike distances to get to them. Mm -hmm. 
We've got time for another couple of questions. If you have any last minute burning questions, here's your moment. Um, another good question, having someone wondering, what is the average size of a harem? So bulls to female ratio in the wild. Oh, it can vary dramatically. Um, you can see harems with one bull and just a few cows or um, harems up to about uh, 20 cows. A lot of it depends on the bull and uh, how healthy he is and what his personality is like. Some bulls are very aggressive and assertive in keeping all their cows close to them and other bulls are much more relaxed. So, but I think 20 is about the largest that they can really handle. And to follow up on that, um, the question from Dee on Facebook, um, wondering if you know what the best place to see muskoxen in the wild would be. Uh, well, in Alaska, if you drive up the hallway towards Prudhoe Bay, uh, nowadays there are often muskoxen near the Sag River, so you can sometimes see them from what we call the Hall Road that um, goes up to Prudhoe Bay. Uh, often there are muskox in the, in the suburbs of Nome, Alaska, which is a place you have to fly to, um, but that's another place to see them. Uh, places in Canada tend to be pretty remote mostly, likewise, in Greenland, which is a long ways to get to anywhere. Um, so. Do you wanna take maybe one more question, Danny? It's a lot easier to see them at the muskox farm in Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> the wild ones. I think that's about, I think there you go, Pam. <laughs> I think that's most of them. That's perfect. All right. Well, I'm sure we we may have missed some questions, mm -hmm. like always. Um, you know, feel free to um, if you want to pop over on Facebook. Uh, we'll have this video is being recorded, this presentation, so we'll have it up on our Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel, and so you can continue to ask us your questions there as well. Um, and we will seek Pam's awesome guidance on on things that we do not know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you so yeah. much, Pam, for being um, a willing expert. Um, this was awesome. And um, we really enjoyed your presentation. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to going back and rewatching it and, and, and really taking it in. <laughs> so, and I think um, just to put the bug in your ear, we are going to try to do more of these. Um, the next one that we have scheduled for this particular series is um, coming up in July. Um, we are going to be talking to Dr. Nicole Ackermans. She is um, working on her, she's working on research, um, looking at uh, muskox skulls and traumatic brain injury in headbutting animals. So that will be really fascinating to hear mm -hmm. what she has to say. Um, that is also on our website, the same place that you found this. Um, and we're just going to keep, we're reaching out to all of our muskox friends in the world. Yep. Um, and we're going to try to get some more of these on the book. So we're looking forward to, to continuing to offer these to all of you. And let us know if there's something burning about a muskox that you just have to know more about. Um, and we would love to look into finding someone who can tell all of us about that, but Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Pam. This has been absolutely wonderful. It's great to see that all of you are interested in, in learning a little bit more too. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful evening wherever you are in the world right now. <laughs> thank you all for joining. Bye. Bye.